Folks, welcome back to another episode of the Shots Fired podcast. Uh, we're super excited to introduce our next guest. Um, he's got 18 years as a police officer. He spent 13 of those years in SWAT. He's got eight years in K-9, four years as a narcotic officer, and four years as uh, assigned to the U.S. Marshals Fugitive Task Force. Uh, December of 2020, he was shot six times, and I repeat, shot six times while attempting to apprehend a wanted subject, uh, and he lives to talk about it. That's pretty amazing. We would like to welcome to the show, TJ Webb. TJ, welcome, man. Yeah, the welcome. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Great to be here. Absolutely. Um, sounds like you have quite a remarkable story to share, and we cannot wait to get into that. Um, but before we do that, let's cover a little bit of your background, you know, um, how you got started in law enforcement and some of the some of the jobs that you've held as a, as a cop. I mean, you've had quite a few. Um, you know, yeah. that's both. like a storybook career right there. Like that's a, most people <laughs> dream of one yeah. of those things yeah, and yeah. you've done like what? Yeah. Five Several. specialty yeah. spots. Sounds like. Yeah. I've been pretty fortunate. Yeah. yeah I've been pretty fortunate. In my career. Yeah. So, Hey, why don't you tell us a little yeah. bit about yourself? I mean, where, where'd you grow up at and, um, what, what got you into law enforcement? Yeah. So I'm uh, born and raised in uh, Delaware. Um, lived here my whole life. Um, the, uh, department I work for now is actually the town I was, uh, born and grew up in. Um, I don't know. I kind of just fell into it. I think I, uh, you know, growing up, my friends or my parents had friends that were police officers and I had, you know, I had friends that whose parents were police officers and, um, just kind of grew up seeing my hometown police officers all the time. And I was like, man, you know, that's kind of cool. I think I want to try it. And, um, after high school, I went to community college and, uh, we have like a beach community here where we're at. Mm-hmm. And they have a lot of like uh, seasonal police officers, like summer help, you know, like uh, not full arrest power so much, but like miscellaneous things. So I did that for a few years. And then um, when I was 20, when I was, when I turned 21, they offered me a job, sent me to the police academy and just kind of fell into it that way, man. Just liked it, fell into it, loved it. and stayed. Nice. There. So you started pretty young then at 21. Yeah. yeah I just turned 21. Yeah. Uh, September. Of uh, 03, I went to the academy and graduated February 04. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I can relate to that. I started when I was 20. So, and yeah. you could probably, you could yeah. probably relate to that. I mean, that's pretty young to start as a cop. Um, yeah. I always thought l- like looking back now, I'm, I'm always like, that was probably, I, I don't probably don't think some really bad. idea. Yeah, <laughs> pr- yeah. Probably somebody that age probably, probably shouldn't be a police officer, but um, yeah, I think life experience having that plays yeah. a huge part of, of being a good, successful caught but whatever nonetheless i mean you you obviously made it yeah. um have a had a successful career um let's talk about uh so you said you started at a smaller agency how big was it oh man it's so my first my first i mean i'm in delaware it's a small state uh so my first agency there was 10 of oh us. wow wow yeah yeah man <laughs> yeah and then my second one there was uh 15 <laughs> <laughs> And then, uh, and then I, I finally fell, fell where I'm at now, which is we're like a mid, we're considered like a mid-sized agency and we're right about 40. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so. so, I mean, still, yeah. still pretty small. Um, you know, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You know, everybody in your department, you guys all know each other at that size. Oh yeah. 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 Cool. Um, yeah. so what, uh, did you get into, uh, what, when did you get started into canine or SWAT or is that, did you get into SWAT pretty early on in your career? probably about year six. Okay. So I was about, I was a year or two into my uh, current agency. Um, they had openings. Uh, I got on there fairly quick just cause you know, the size, size of our department, yeah. and, you know, manpower. So I, I got on there after about a year or two and um, stayed on it. Yeah. I mean, I liked it. Have fun with two basic squad, advanced squad, um, a couple like, you know, smaller, like uh, sniper observer courses and stuff like that. Yeah. Nice. Did you have any good SWAT call outs yeah. um, as your time and as a SWAT guy? Yeah, first few years, man, on the team, we were we were rocking pretty good. I mean, we were, I mean, for out here, I mean, you guys run them a lot more out there than we do, man, for sure. We, we were probably running one or two calls a month, but mostly drug wars mm-hmm. we were doing. Um, and then, uh, you know, policing changed across the country. Yeah. So um, 
the use of the team kind of slowed down quite a bit. Yeah. But uh, but still act. We still have an active team. Still use it. Yeah. And it's a part time ancillary yeah. assignment. I'm I'm assuming. Part time, yeah. yeah part time. Everybody, you know, we're, most most guys were patrol. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you got into narcotics right before you became a canine handler. Yeah. So um, again, I was a couple years on where I'm at, and um, we had a we had a guy we had a drug unit, and they needed like a part time kind of help out with it. So I uh, I got on there. Basically part time. It was like in and out, like a month here, a month there for a couple of years, mm-hmm. back and forth between there and patrol. Okay. Um, and then after that, uh, we got some K nine slots open, and put in for that. Got that. Spent another six years with that. And um, let's see, uh, two thousand seventeen, my dog got sick. It was like Fourth of July, two thousand seventeen. We're on our way home from day work, and. Uh, he got real uh, lethargic in the back seat, um, and he was he was kind of throwing up a little bit. And I thought, wow, he's just you know he's hacking something up. He always does that shit, you know what I mean? You know, how it is. yeah. Okay, no, it's like just sometimes I throw some shit up. So I get home, crack open the door, hop, he easily hops out, runs over the uh, kennel. And he just kind of sat there, didn't want to get out. So I uh, called the uh, emergency vet, took him to the vet. They uh, admitted him on uh, dehydration. Um, they're going to keep him overnight. See how he is in the morning. So I was like, all right, you know, go to bed. I get a call about three o'clock. Uh, they call me and say something went right with him. They're going to take him back into surgery, see what's going on. And uh, they took him back into surgery, opened him up, and he was, he died on the table. Apparently, he was ate up with cancer real bad. Oh, we never knew it. Yeah, man. And, uh, yeah, so he died uh, Died the morning of July 5th. Man, that's, that's brutal. Rough. Yeah, that's rough. You know, it always, it amazes me sometimes with these dogs. You hear stories like that, you know, like, guys will bring their dogs to work. Everything's cool. And then it's like, you'll have some like odd change of behavior in the dog. And then, you know, you take him to the vet and it's like, Hey, he's got cancer and he's, you know, next thing you know, he's dying like fairly quickly. And it's just crazy to me how that works out. So, well, I'm sorry to hear that. How long did you have him? Yeah, I'll tell you what else, what else, what else amazing me with those dogs, man, is the pain they can take and you never know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, they can take a lot of stuff, man. You, you, like you, dogs ate it with cancer for how long? I don't even know. I mean, I, Never had a clue. Yeah. You know? yeah, I know. That's that's the things with these dogs. It's like you don't know when they're sick, you know. Um, you know, and w- one thing to look out for if you're a dog handler listening to this is um, if you're if you start seeing a um, a change in behavior in your dog that you're not used to seeing, um, and it may be something something subtle like uh, you know maybe he doesn't want to do do a certain thing that like you know he does all the time. Um, you know, little subtle stuff like that. If you start seeing a weird change of behavior in your dog, that that could be a, a sign of of an illness, and you should go go take your dog to the vet, get get a blood, get their blood taken, get it get it analyzed, and uh, you you may find that your dog may have cancer or a tumor or or something going on. So, I think a lot of handlers actually take that for actually I don't even want to say they take it for granted. I just truly think that a lot of guys don't know don't know that about dogs. Um, you know, so I've worked around dogs that same thing. They were diagnosed with a cancer, suddenly die. And, and, um, and then when you go back and talk to some of the handlers, you know, they'll, they'll point out certain things like certain change of behaviors in their dog that they kind of brushed off is just like, oh, I, he's just being quirky or whatever. Well, if you're seeing that in your dog, like that, that may be a sign you got, you may want to go get, get your dog checked out at the vet. So anyways, um, yeah, I started to hear about that. How long did you have them? Uh, six years pushing seven yeah so quite a while yeah Yeah, quite a while and uh he was a great dog i mean he was a great tracker i mean i have i was one of the best times of my career man with that dog it was awesome yeah yeah. awesome yeah and a member of the family i'm guessing too like uh yeah absolutely yeah 100 yeah 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 Definitely. You guys took it was a, it was a blur of the whole family, man. Yeah. You, got, you guys took them home with you. I mean, most most agencies do. Yeah, some some don't. Yeah, and it was and it's a blow. It's a blow to the family, not just cause, and for everything, man. I mean, you're it's a it's like it changes your whole life at home, but it also changes your changes you at work too. Because now instead of going to work and you know with your car and your dog, you're going back to patrol, and you know it's just yeah. a totally different, totally different, totally different game, man. You know, I mean, you know how it is. It's just yeah, totally different. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, you and Billy have the narcotic thing in in, in common, and and the fugitive stuff. I yeah, mean, what was yeah. uh, yeah. how'd you like being a dope cop? It's a lot of fun, man. Yeah, it's a lot <laughs> yeah. of fun. Uh, <laughs> I never did. I it's never a lot did. Of, it's it. a good job, man. Uh, it, it, it had it had its ups and downs for sure, um, but it's, it was a fun gig. Um, 
but I, I, you know, as you said, the uh, the task force stuff. Um, once I rolled into the marshals for the task force position, I mean, it was like that was the funnest thing I've ever done, man. Yeah, I agree. I, <laughs> yeah, fugitive stuff is. Yeah, it's uh, it's go go go. You know, it's yeah. it's a lot of it's, and you work with the greatest people. I think you, you know. I, I don't know how your department is, yeah. or how it is. It's it's a it's a highly sought after position, which means you usually get some pretty yeah, good, get. some pretty good people on those yeah. teams. Both narcotics. Best and, dudes ever worked. Yeah, in uh, narco- like I'm sure narcotics out there is is different than it is out here. Um, you know what what's the what's the what's the big drug out there? What what was what you guys are going to crack and heroin. crack and heroin? Yeah, I mean it's that's pretty much your, your two big things there, man. You got a little bit of everything, but crack and heroin's. On and top. are you guys dealing on narcotics? We're dealing with like trafficking or like street sales. What, what was what you were dealing with a lot of? Uh, my agency, we were most mostly like street sales. Okay. Yeah. Well, the one thing about my department is like we're a small agency, so our drug unit consists of one, sometimes two guys, <laughs> which is like impossible to do drugs. So, uh, luckily, it's a small state, so you rely a lot on your neighboring agencies to help out. So it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. You guys deal with um, you, you guys have a lot of meth out there. I don't, we don't have a lot of it. We see it from time to time, but we don't have a lot of it. Yeah. It's funny. Cause like around here, I mean, that's primarily what we, we see, right? I mean, meth, heroin is obviously huge and then yeah. fentanyl now is a big thing, but yeah, crack fentanyl, is yeah. kind of, I don't know. I mean, do you see a lot of crack? I don't know. Really see that very often. It, it's bad. It's, it's made a man, comeback. We see a lot out here. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Out here it has. Out here it's made a big comeback. Yeah. I have lately actually. Yeah. Um, we have found it on, on some folks lately, um, which I've, oh, I thought was kind of odd because I mean, that's just never really been a, a drug we see around here. That's kind of a thing of the past, but well, it, it goes with, uh, you know, economics. I always say out here in California, we have, uh, the great border to our South that, um, has, gives us copious amounts of methamphetamine. So, you know, yeah. when you're talking about crack, which would kind of be the rival drug, I would say, um, uh, you're, you're talking a lot more money involved in it. So, so people are just like, ah, oh, I can get this cheap stuff that does the same thing. We might as well get the cheap stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a price point battle out here with that, you know, heroin and crack is back and forth. You know? Yeah. It's whatever's cheaper is what's, it's what's flying. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. So, um, when you, uh, let's talk a little bit about canine stuff because obviously I'm a dog guy and why wouldn't we? Yeah. That's, that's the coolest job yeah, there right. is. <laughs> well, I mean, he just said the is the most fun. Guy. But I mean, you know, I, uh, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now when you were a dog handler, um, I'm assuming that was a patrol dog, right? So was it, was it a uh, dual purpose? Was it single purpose? Um, dual purpose drugs. Nice. Okay. Drugs yeah. and, and protection. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. you guys get a lot of dog deployments out there. I mean, um, you got any cool, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we got, uh, I think I had bite apprehensions. I think I had seven or okay. eight, which is, which is a pretty good number for out yeah. here. Um, tracks i think on tracks i had apprehensions on tracks i think i was like 97 really yeah that's really that's good that's track. good yeah you know funny funny um, thing about tracking is um i think out out where you guys are out on the east coast you know it's a pretty pretty big deal um oddly yeah. enough out here in california it's not that it's not that huge of a um we don't do it a whole lot um really? you know some guys do it but yeah, we do, you know, we do a lot of area search, like, um, um, yeah. you know, like cast a dog out and, and do some, you know, scent cone, um, area type searching. And we're not doing actual tracking. Like I said, there's, there's a few guys that do it, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. A lot of, like article searches and whatnot. Yeah. We'll do article searches. Um, yeah. you know, but as far as tracking goes, it's a lot of work, work to do to, first of all, to oh, train yeah. the dog to even get to track. And then, you know, it's something that you got to like maintain all the time. And for whatever, it's constant yeah, work. for whatever reason, it's just really not like a, uh, it's not like a big thing out here for, for whatever, whatever reason, but does that have anything to do with like our, our demographics and just not at we, all, just the way that right. we're, we're very urban. Not, know? not at all, man. No? no, I mean that uh, a lot of people think that, um, but then some of the, one of the best trackers in the nation is a, a guy from Phoenix PD and you know, the train out there is, it's just pure yeah. asphalt rock and it's very hot weather. And 
hard service. Yeah, a lot of lot every almost everything is hard service out there. So um, that's a big yeah, yeah big miss misconception that people have. I, I I think is that dogs can only track on you know certain type of surfaces or whatever, and that's that's obviously yeah. not true unless you're really in the canine world. There's so much intricate stuff to know about canines and how they work and you know, and how odor works and all that. So anyways, we're not going to get into that, but, um, uh, so you had some dog apprehensions with your canine. Unfortunately, it sounds like he got uh, cancer and then passed away on July 5th. Uh, yep. what would you do after your, your dog passed away? Are you guys allowed to get another dog after that? Or do you have to transition back to patrol? Um, it's all up to the administration. So, uh, I had a meeting with my administration to talk about it, um, about getting another one. Um, and they felt it was time for me to move on to better things. Um, younger guys, yeah. we got younger guys wanted a chance at a dog. I was a little older in the department. So, um, I kind of understood. So, um, it was either go back to patrol or they offered me the slot in the drug unit. So I took slot in the drug unit and loved it, man. It was, it was a good choice. I kind of thought about it for a few days. Like, I don't know, but it worked out for me. Yeah. I think change is always good in our job. I mean, um, you know, especially at a smaller agency, I, I, I can, I can understand them, you know, get wanting to give other people a chance because if, if how, how many canines did you even have? Two. two okay. Yeah. So yeah, two guys. I mean, if you soak that up for, you know, 15 plus years, if yeah, you had two dogs, yeah, you, you, know, mean, then, you just ruin careers for everybody else. Yeah. You know I mean, so. yeah. So I, I get it. It's tough, yeah. but I, I, I totally understand it. Um, so let's talk about how you got on the fugitive task force team and how, how did that come about? Um, so, yeah, so, you know, they talked to me about doing task forces, you know, um, they wanted me to get on a drug task force, obviously, cause I was in the drug unit, mm-hmm. but I want to do something a little different, mixed up a little bit. Um, the Marshall's task force was kind of like, I feel like it was kind of up and coming here. Uh, I knew some guys on there, so I put a letter in to go to that, uh, admin approved it, sent it off and. It took me on. So I've been doing drugs and uh, the Marshalls, the fugitive thing kind of hand in hand. Well, I think that uh, especially smaller agencies, the, the task force is, is really important because yeah. you get you get that, that whole other world of, you know, a, a lot bigger area. I'm yeah. sure I'm sure you've seen the entire state of Delaware at this point oh, yeah, on, yeah, on yeah. task force. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you bring that you bring that back to your department, too. And your department has the ability to ask you questions and things like that. Yeah. That I, I think is the task force is, is always important for especially small agencies to get involved yeah. in. And it worked out good, man, because I mean, doing drug work, I mean, how many people, how many investigations do you do drug wise where there's somebody wanted for some violent felony? You know? No, I mean, yeah. So, I mean, it, it worked out good to have the task force, you know, doing those operations with me. So. And what, what was your guys' role? I mean, what, for the task force? How did you, yeah, like what was your role in the task force or the, in the team that you were on? What were you guys tasked with? Uh, violent fugitives, so anything from, you know, robberies, burglaries, uh, sex crimes up to, you know, homicide. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, how long were you on the team before you got in your, your incident? Um, I think we were just coming into year four. Year four, I think. Yeah. So you'd been there for a little while. Yeah. Three, four years. Yeah. And now prior to that, and we'll get into that story in just a second, but prior to that, um, do any, uh, any good stories stand out to you? I mean, as far as tracking folks down, um, yeah, man, we had, uh, this is like when I really knew my dog could track. I mean, I knew, I knew it could track really good, but this one just like solidified it. You know what I mean? We had, uh, we had a burglary one night. Um, guy got assaulted pretty bad with a knife and uh show up get my dog out do a track and we had it was like a 1.2 mile track on hard surface found the guy uh in an apartment complex underneath of a car on a cell phone covered in blood still uh connor for a ride to come pick him up and like we're talking about tracking earlier but hard surface track's not easy you yeah. know so i was really i was really impressed with that yeah and um but then the one, my dog and I had a rough relationship getting getting going. He was he was like a mal trapped in a shepherd's body. Yeah, it's like my dog. It was just he was nuts, man. And uh, I just like he just got my nerves all the time. I said, man, I can't stand this freaking dog sometimes. And then uh, we were, <laughs> I was like, he's just killing me, man. And then we were on the road for probably not quite a year. It was probably like eight months or something. We were on the road, and um, 
I stopped the guy one night for a suspicious activity and whatnot. <laughs> and, um, guy ended up, uh, turning on me, you know, throwing a punch at I had him in front of my car. He turned, turned around and tried to throw a punch at me. I ended up tripping over the curb. Uh, guy got on top of me and tried to like dog pile me and, uh, had that door pop, man. And I hit that yeah. door, hit that door pop. Guy heard it, got up, took off running across the street. My partner came around the car. My dog came around the car, stopped and looked at me, and I was like, "Go get him!" And he, yeah. just took off, man. <laughs> he just took off like oh, I was waiting for that. He called the guy, man, like right across the street and sidewalk. It was like, "All right, that's my boy. Man. Yeah. This is my dog yeah. now." You know, and that kind of like that made it for me. So yeah, too good. Yeah, and that yeah, that's a great feeling when yeah. um yeah you know, when you got a dog like that 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 saves you or or saves your partner or whatever. Like those are always cool stories to me. Those, those always stood out to me as yeah. like I was so proud of the dog when something like that happened. Yeah, it's a great feeling, man. Yeah. So, okay. So you're on the fugitive task force now for about two years or I'm sorry, four years. Yeah. Um, you want to walk us through, uh, the, the night of your incident where you got shot, how it all started. I mean, start from the beginning. Yeah. So, um, usual day at work, we get home, you know, getting ready for dinner and whatnot. Um, we operate with like group text, you know, for information with everybody. So we get a group text with, um, information for a fugitive out of Pennsylvania, that Pennsylvania's tracking. Um, Intel is he's down at a at a hotel, which is uh kind of like near the area where, where where I live at, and um so the plan was to go game in the morning, and uh, I was like, well, you know, it's not far from where I'm at, so if you got vehicle information, just send it over. I ride over and check for the vehicle, and, you know, we'll see, we'll, we'll just you know confirm that the, the, the vehicle is there or not. So I head on over, pull in the parking lot, see the vehicle park call my supervisor and i'm like hey man car is here as i'm on the phone with him dude walks out to the car gets in it um he's got uh, his girlfriend and a couple of little kids with him. Uh, i let the car go it's just me so i'm not gonna do anything so i let the car go yeah. um go back home um we all talk about it a little bit and i'm like man like the guys at the hotel you know I, he's wanted for attempted murder i don't really want to wait till tomorrow being that we know where he's at right now you know, yeah. I mean, he, he could leave in the middle of the night, you know, some road cop could pull him over tonight and not know what he was dealing with. Something bad could happen. We know what we're dealing with. We know where he's at. I, I feel like it's on us to go make that happen, you know. So we all decided, you know, it's, it's time to do it. So uh, it gets approved. Um, we head back out there. I get there first. He's, he's not back yet. So I'm sitting in the parking lot. Uh, two of my other partners show up. Um, there's, uh, there's a handful of guys that are still on their way. There's probably... I don't know, maybe like six or seven guys that are still on their way. Um, but they're a little ways out, probably like half hour. Uh, guy pulls back in the parking lot, uh, takes the parking spot. And it's just the three of us. Um, ideally, you don't want to take a vehicle with three guys. But our fear was if we let him go back into the hotel, um, you know, we're going to have possible a hostage situation with these other with mm -hmm. these kids and girlfriend or murder suicide or you know hotel room walls or you know paper thin if you get if you get into something you know someone innocent gets hit so we just thought you know we've done this many times there's three of us it's not ideal but let's go ahead and take this guy in the parking lot before he gets inside this hotel so we come up with a game plan i'm gonna be pin vehicle from the rear um uh, i got one guy coming from driver's side one guy coming from pastor side and there's cars parked next to him, so they can't get right up on him to pin him. Um, so I come up from the rear, and as I exit my vehicle, um, I'm kind of like at an angle, like caddy corner to like his rear driver's side, because I can't get in directly behind him. Um, so as I get out of my vehicle, uh, his driver's side door kind of like cracks open, and I see his hand come out, and I just start seeing muzzle flashes. Um, at this point, I'm probably about 10 feet, 6 to 10 feet. Um so I start taking rounds, um, throwing rounds back at him. Um, luckily, when I did the pin, I didn't di I didn't make positive contact with the rear of his vehicle, which left me a, pl a hole to go for cover. It was the only place I had to go for cover at the point with the way my vehicle was positioned. So I made I made I was you know shooting, moving, made cover over to the right to the rear of his vehicle. Uh, as I was moving the cover, uh, one of the rounds I took was in my right femur, which dropped me at the rear of his vehicle. Um, I don't remember going down. Um, I think my body went into shock when my leg got hit. 
So I remember he and I engaging one another. And then uh, I remember being on the ground. And as I was on the ground, I remember hearing uh, gunfire going off still. Um, I could see my gun underneath the, his vehicle by the uh, tire. Because when I fell, I landed on my hands, apparently. And uh, I took around in my left hand. And uh, as I fell, I actually fractured both my thumbs. So, like, my hands wouldn't even, they, they wouldn't even work. So, like, I couldn't even grab my gun. But I knew I had to get the cover because the guy wasn't far from me if he was still there. So, I ended up crawling uh, underneath the back of his vehicle, underneath the rear. Um, her, her shots going off for a while. Uh, once once the shot stopped, it wasn't long, it was, you know, seconds. Excuse me. And uh, I heard one of my partners yelling for me, uh, yelled back, come here, pull me out, ask me where you're hit. I said, man, I don't know. I just know my legs messed up. I don't know. My, my, my legs messed up. My hands are jacked up. I don't, I'm not really sure where all my injuries are. So he threw a tourniquet on me, uh, threw me back to the vehicle, and off went to the hospital, man. Um, you know, like pre-op, we always plan, um, like, uh, our routes to the nearest hospital and stuff because not everybody's familiar with the area all the time. So we always, like, yeah. preload it in our GPS. So uh, as he comes out of the parking lot with me, I'm in the back seat. Uh, his phone falls off the dashboard, rolls under the seat. So of course, yeah, he doesn't know where the fuck we are, you know? So, no. um, <laughs> so he's like, you know, you got to tell me where we're going. And I'm like, okay, you know, well, I'm looking out the window and like, I'm familiar with the air. So I'm looking out the back window and I'm starting to see like billboards for like restaurants I recognize. And I'm like, I mean, you going South? It's like, yeah, we're, yeah, we're going <laughs> South. I was like, all right, well, we need to go North. So whip it around. <laughs> oh. So that first U-turn, man, I could, uh, that was, I could feel that one. Cause, uh, like I said, my leg was, my leg was, my fear, but my femur was shattered. So it was like every movement. It just, you know, I could feel it. Um, and, uh, he had just gotten this, uh, it was a Jeep Cherokee. He just gotten it for the task force. And this thing is like brand new, man. It's like blacked out leather. I mean, this thing is legit. It's like nicer than my car at home, man. This thing is legit. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I'm bleeding in the backseat and everything, and I'm doing, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in shock a little bit. It's just why I can't feel all my pain because your body's in shock. It's, it's going to happen. Yeah. Know? Um, yeah. but luckily I was able to stay cool and, um, keep my breathing down, keep my heart rate elevated. You know, I didn't want to, I didn't want my heart rate to get up too much and start pumping blood because I didn't know how bad I was bleeding, you know? Yeah. So, um, we're just having a conversation in the back seat, man. I was like, look, man, I, I, I'm really sorry about your car back here. Like, I'm, I'm bleeding everywhere. He was like, man, I'm not worried about the car. Just stay awake, you know? And I'm like, I know, man, but I know how much you love this car. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then we, we laugh about that now. He tells everybody, like, I can't believe you were telling jokes in the back seat. But, um, yeah, so we get to the hospital, um, which was, you know, it's like five minutes. It wasn't far. And um, they ripped me out on the gurney, take me in. Um, they, you know, trying to get my plate carrier off. And so I had, so, the last thing I remember is trying to tell them how to get my plate carrier off after that. <laughs> I don't remember anything until like that was on a Thursday night. I don't remember anything until like Saturday, really. They just because they kept me out because I had uh that was about seven forty five on a Thursday night, and then I had surgery uh, the following day at like I don't know, it was like two or three o'clock or something. And then, yeah. And then I was up in the ICU until like the next day, and then they took me down to recovery for like the rest of the week. Yeah. Man, what wow. um uh, what uh what kind of gun uh, did he have? Uh, he had a. Taurus nine millimeter purple in color, a real man gun. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's odd. Yeah. Yeah. Purple, it was kinda, huh? yeah it's purple. Yeah. Apparently it was his girlfriend's. So mm. yeah. So what kind of vehicle were you driving? I was in a Dodge Nitro. Okay. So, yeah. um, when, no ballistic panels or it's a, your standard yeah, detective. Standard, yeah. Standard. Dodge unmarked. Nitro, unmarked. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I had lights like in a dash and shit, but there's no marking. It was just plain Jane Dodge Nitro. Yeah, yeah. And where? So when you initiated the stop before he cracked the door and started shooting, you got out. Are you like right there in the threshold of the? Yeah, of the door, that was the that, driver's that's, side door. Yeah, so that's kind of like one of the things that fucked me was um, the way my vehicle had to be positioned when I opened my door. It was like I'm right there. Um, yeah. Uh. So yeah, like I said, luckily I didn't make positive contact, which left a hole for me to move to. Um, yeah, was it instantaneous? I mean, did you guys light him up or with, with your your emergency so, guys? Or did you just pull yeah. him behind him or no? He, he was lit up with lights and whatnot, um, and he knew, man. I mean, the guy was he did count surveillance coming in. He did a lap around the park, not the whole the whole nine. You know what I mean? And um, and we recognize that, but it's just one of those things, man. You do it enough. You know, I don't like to use the word complacency because you know what you're doing, but at the same time, it's like, all right, well, 
you know, we got to get this guy before we get we, – we had this thing that we had to get him before he got inside because I, th- I felt like once he got inside, it was going to be a lot worse than what was going to be in that parking lot, you know? And, yeah, no doubt. And I've been there too where you, you want to do it in the vehicle. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, you, you like knowing what you know is, is what I say, especially yeah. in, in any, in any takedown is you, you're looking at a vehicle and you know, 90% of the time or 99% of the time, you know, that there's one, two, three, whatever vehicle, people in the car. Yeah. And, and that helps out a lot. Whereas once people go behind doors, you don't know where they're at inside that place. You don't yeah. know if there's, you know, an unknown family that he's already have hostage. You don't know yeah. if he's got it. I mean, you go to that, you go there. to the hotel room door and he starts throwing rounds to the door. I mean, you going to throw rounds back in. Cause now, now you know, he has kids and a girlfriend in there. Yeah. I mean, probably yeah. not. Right. Probably not. Yeah. Right. And now you got, probably, now you got his not. rounds going through the door, going through the hotel room walls. I mean, it's just a, it's a bad situation, man. Yeah. You know, that, that brings up a, a quick little good topic. I mean, anytime you have to weigh out, like, do you allow someone to go inside with, with multiple people, especially a family with kids, or do you handle it outside? I mean, we, we deal with that stuff constantly. And, and I think you really, you really got to weigh that out. You know, what, what's the risk of doing it outside, which there's obviously always going to be a risk, but then what's, what's the risk of letting them go inside and how do those outweigh each other? Um, at least think about it. You know, if they're by themselves, maybe, maybe let them go inside, you know, but, but obviously in this case, he's not, um, I, to be honest with you, dude, I would have, I would have done the same thing. Just always weigh those options out. Some, some, you know, one, yep. one shoe size doesn't fit all. So there's, there's never a right answer. No, there's never, no. there's never like in this situation no, you do this. There's a million ways to do that stuff. Yeah. Man. So, you know, to be yeah. honest, man, like I said, the way you guys handled it, I, I would have been thinking the same thing you were thinking. Um, I like the tactics on that. Billy, I don't know if you agree. A hundred percent. It's uh, I mean, well, I've, I've done that multiple times and, Fortunately, it's worked yeah. out every time for me. So, um, so yeah, so it's um, the nature of the beast, man. Yeah. So it sounds like he just basically instantly opens up fire on you guys. He knows you're there. He opens up fire. Yeah. You're obviously immediately hit. You said you you were able to get some yeah. rounds out. Um, able to yeah, return fire. I got fire. some rounds out. I was able to return fire on him. Um, he was still he was still he was still able to make it about like 70, 70 some yards before he uh before he expired but yeah so, i mean he had some had some adrenaline going to get him moving and where was your where so, was your everyone, all, all those all those all these all these you know everyone out there that thinks you you know you shoot a bad guy one time and they're gonna go down it's that's not realistic no not at all you yeah know? no i can contest that all day long yeah. you know unless you're shooting them yeah even with a rifle you know i mean yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you, man. I'm in the movies. It's like, I think a lot of cops think that you get in some type of like deadly encounter, lethal encounter and you shoot someone and they're going to go down immediately. And that that's just not the way it's going to work. Just as if it's not happening. Yeah. Just like we're trained to fight through it. You know, um, their bodies, yeah. their bodies do the same thing. Ours does, you know, we're all, we're all human, yeah. you know, so adrenaline, right. adrenaline yep. kicks in and you'd be amazed what adrenaline can do for a, for a human. It's amazing. Absolutely. So, um, where would your, where was your partner at relevant to, to where you were at? Um, cause obviously he's returning fire, right? Uh, the partners. Yeah. Yeah. So initially, initially when, when he and I engaged, engaged one another, um, they couldn't see him because the other vehicles parked next to his vehicle and the way they had to come in, um, they could see muzzle flashes and they could see me. Um, but they, they couldn't see him until he took off running and then they were able to, um, you know, he fired at them and then they were able to return fire back. Um, but in the initial contact, it was just, it was just, he and I. Okay. And then yeah. obviously they, so they saw you, they saw muzzle flashes and I'm guessing they saw you go down. Right. And I, I mean, that's, yeah. you know, to them, I'm sure they, they were dealing with their own, own issues with that too. You know, they had to do, they, they still had to deal with the threat. Yeah. Right. They, they still had to deal with the threat. Yeah. And, and that's a test to them too. I mean, that's a, you know, that's all law enforcement should know, like no matter what, yeah, there's shitty situations we all are going to be in at some point probably, or maybe, or yeah. hopefully not, but you still got your job to do. And you know, that's keeping the public yep. and yourself safe. And, and that's what they did. And then that sounds like they did a yep. great job of, giving you aid and doing the exact right thing. They did a great job, man. It just goes to show, you know, training kicks in, you know, you've trained yeah. enough, you know, same yeah. nations, medical. I mean, it's important to keep on top of that stuff in this job. 
And, and you said that they, you know, like you guys work in areas that some people aren't familiar with and, you know, knowing where that hospital is, knowing where you're going to go. Yeah. Sometimes it's just knowing where a, a fire station is maybe and, you know, getting yeah. there or whatever it is, but always have that plan. You know, nobody wants to ever need, yeah. need that plan. And they're always hoping that yep. it's stupid. Yeah. yeah, We all hope it's stupid, yeah. but when you need it, yeah. you need it. Yeah. When you need it. You need it, man. Yeah. So, so when you initially, uh, when you initially got hit, I mean, obviously you knew that you were, you were shot, right? You, you went down when you got shot in the femur. Yeah. Um, what was going through yeah, your head? I, I knew, I knew it was hit. Yeah. What, um, what was going through your head at that man, time? Honestly, other than get the cover, um, the only thing that was going through my head was my family, man. And it's like, the, it's the main thing. I mean, I, that, I mean, that was the first thing really I, after I was hit and I was on the ground, the first thing I popped in my head was, uh, it was like a voice in my, in my head, in my head, telling me you failed, you failed, you failed your family. That was, it just got like playing over and over again. But at the same time, you know, I was doing what I was trying to do and I was getting my ass to cover, you know? Um, so I got, you know, once I got the cover, it just, I started, you know, I started realizing what was going on and, you know, trying to slow down my breathing, you know, trying to figure out, that, you know, they're still, they're still out there. They can hear me, you know, um, paying attention to the gunfire, just trying to keep in, trying to keep my mind right on what was going on in, in the, in the environment around me. So, but yeah, the first thing was, was family, man. That was the first thing that popped in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's incredible. I mean, we, we never really want to think like that, that situation is going to happen to, yeah. to any of us, you know, and when it does, um, right. you know, how do you, how do you really prepare for something like that? You really can't, I mean, you can't train for that. No. Um, but no, you know, so, so you crawl under the car, um, where, where his, uh, did he have his girlfriend and his kids in the car at the time of the shooting? Yeah. So actually once he started firing, um, they bailed out on the pasture side and uh, took off running back to the hotel. Wow! So they got yeah. out. So yeah. actually, so one, so one of the one of the things that actually I have to cut you off. One of the things that actually made him take off running was uh, my partner on the pasture side of vehicle. Um, he did engage him, which called, which is why he took off running. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think, I don't think he actually knew he was there. I don't think he knew my partner was there. I think he was just focused on me, and. Then, and when, when my partner th started throwing rounds at him, I think he was kind of like, oh, shit. And that's when he took off on foot. He actually ran by me. He ran to the rear of the vehicle and, and passed me on foot when I was on the ground. No kidding. So he actually get, so he got out yeah. and he ran backwards back towards your, your car. Yeah, he ran to the rear of the vehicle. Yeah. And yep, back in. But yeah, pass. Yeah, pass me to the rear of the vehicle out to the parking lot. OK. And, and that doesn't that seems like he's taking the, you know, he probably opened his door with another car there and now his doors in his way. So he just started running yeah. wherever the hell he could run to get yeah, away yeah. from, you know, not, not, yeah, he could, he could, he wouldn't be, yeah, he wouldn't be able to go the other direction. Yeah. He had to, he, he only had one way to go and it was to the, to the, to the rear past me. It was the only way he could go. Man. Yeah. That's pretty wild that, um, his girlfriend and the kids were able to get out of car. That that's all, that's like a nightmare scenario for a cop to have to return fire into a, into a vehicle or was terrible. wherever with kids or, yeah. you know, but, um, you got to do yeah. what you got to do to survive. Right. I mean, um, yep. You know, what else are you going to do is be, yeah. you'd be a sitting duck, you know? Yeah. You, you can't, you can't just sit there. You gotta do something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, you guys talked about game planning or whatever. Um, I, I, I think something really important that comes out of this is, well, there's a lot of things, but something that stands out to me is the game planning of stuff. And I, and I've said this so many times, um, you know, mostly to, to a lot of new canine guys is, you know, have having your cell phones um, where your local vets are, your your trauma vets, not just a regular vet, but a trauma vet. Because when your dog gets shot or stabbed or whatever, you need to get him to a vet. Um, you got to know where you're going. So this translates into like you guys were talking about when you're making these ops plans. And, you know, like I've said, I've not that I've ever done one. I've just been a part of a lot being a dog handler and, and helping execute them. Um, you know, I've kind of been in the process of how they're doing them. And I can see a lot of guys or how you would probably feel like having to do all this paperwork. And you're like, yeah, like Billy said, you're like, this is dumb or, um, kind of complacent about doing it all yeah. and not probably not taking a lot of that serious when you're, you know, you're in a room and you're going over the ops plan with, with everyone that's involved in the operation. And some guys probably aren't paying attention to everything in the ops plan, like something simple, like oh, yeah. where the hospital is. 
probably not a lot of people pay attention to that um, until something really right. bad happens. How important is that? That is like, cr- that is probably the most crucial, crucial part of an ops plan is, yeah, dude, like, yeah. hey, if one of us goes down, how yeah. how are we going to yeah. get out? Are we waiting for an ambulance? I don't know what, yeah. what the response time is where you're at, but yeah. even for us, a response time for an ambulance to get to one of us would, would probably be, be really quickly because we work in a big city type environment. The problem is you've got, yeah. you know, a ton of cops there. More than likely, you're going to have a ton of cops there. They're blocking the roadway. Medics w- where we work, they're not going to come in if the scene is not considered safe. You know, so all these contingency right. plans of how you're going to get cops out of the scene, how are you going to evacuate people? Where are you parking your patrol cars? Are you blocking the streets? You know, all those little things. I mean, those yeah. are those play a huge, crucial role. Um, and I got to be involved in a, in a, um, a guy at his department uh, a few months ago got shot and um, kind of same deal. You know what, what you guys were doing. They're trying to apprehend a shooting suspect and same thing. Right. They wedge the vehicle and a guy opens fire. And he gets hit uh, in the in the stomach just below his vest. And, um, you know, I remember one thing that stuck out to me is I'm I'm one of the first guys there. And, you know, I just all these cars that just start blocking the roadway of the small road that we're on. And we're trying to we're trying to, you know, we load him in the back of a car. I'm in the back seat with them and we're trying to get out of there, get him to the hospital. And it's like we're yelling at guys to move their cars. And, you know, I guess my point is, is those are all little things that are not a lot of people probably think about. That's a nightmare, but it could become a, yeah, it could become a really bad yeah. nightmare if shit goes bad. Um, so, you know, think about that crap when you're going to a call yeah, or, well, well always some stuff it. you just can't, some stuff you just, some stuff you just can't plan for. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, like in our situation, you know, like we had all that stuff worked out, you know, the, the, uh, the, the GPS is stuff. It's just, you know, some shit happens like with us pulling out of the park lot and the phone, falls off the dash, you get stuck under the seat. And you can't, you can't, yeah, something it, like, stupid. Like you just can't plan for something. But, um, yeah. That's crazy. Something guess, silly is that stupid. I have something, so, but, not, like, to your, even, but, but to your point, yeah, we had all that worked out. Yeah. And I have some, not even close to that same standard, but you know, I, we were working in a, an area where we don't have radios in, in another County and uh, we worked off of our, our cell phones, our department cell phones with the, you know, like a push to talk kind of thing. And, uh, first thing I do, you know, a car takes off. I go to take it, put my phone down on the, on the center console of the car, you know, make two turns and (laughs) gone phones gone. Right now I'm in a, (laughs) I'm in an area. I don't know. I have no communications with my partners at this point. And I'm like, all right, well, you know, like we'll, we'll see how this goes for a little (laughs) bit, but you know, you you gotta, you gotta think about your like, so now I'm thinking, (laughs) oh shit, this guy does what, what happened to you. He, He comes out shooting and I'm like. My partners are like, no idea where I am. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have no way of telling yeah. them where I am if I'm able to. And, you know, always, you know, yeah. have backup plans kind of deal is, uh, you know, it's, it would be my public service. Yeah. Now always expect the unexpected, man. Yeah. 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 And, you know, in like your guys' scenario, you didn't do anything yeah. wrong. It's just the perks of the job. You know, you can do everything right and, and bad things can still happen. Um, but you know, yeah. plan, plan for yeah. when those bad things happen, you know, don't, don't always yep. assume that, you know, shit's going to go the way you want it to go. And nine out of 10 times, let, let's be honest, it, it probably does in our career, nine out of 10 times, yeah. people do yeah. what we ask them to do. It's that one time that, that someone's like, yeah. I'm not doing it. Um, you know, then, then what are you going to do? So, um, <clears throat> and on a, on a fugitive team, yeah. you know, you're, you're not, you know, that you're yeah. not going That's after, you know, yeah. the, the, the grandma around the corner. It's uh, you know, you know who you're going after, you know what they've done, you know, their criminal history, yeah. you know, these things, you know, what guns are outstanding, what kind of stuff right. like that. And that's, the all, worst of the worst. that's all going yeah. through your mind th- during this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So how did your uh, wife end up finding out that you were in the hospital and that you had been shot? I mean, did anybody reach out to her? How did, how did, how did it go about that? She found out about it. Uh, so it was pretty quick, actually. Um, cell phones and social media and everything now. I mean, everyone knew about what was going on within minutes. Um, she actually found out through a friend calling her and uh, asking if she needed anything, uh, if she was all right. And my wife didn't know what she was talking about. So that's kind of how she found out. Um, and it wasn't anybody's fault, um, you know, at my department or anything. It was just 
you know, actually with social yeah. media and stuff, yeah. just the way it is. Yeah, you know? that's that's wild, man. So she found out because someone called her and just asked her, "Hey, what's going on?" And she's yeah. like, "What are you talking about?" That's yeah. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, hey, if you need anything, let me know. I'm yeah. here. And my wife was like. And we, and we were talking earlier off air um, about how, like, uh, you know, fugitive team, canine, whatever it is, SWAT, narcotics, they're all small teams, right? And and you get to know your partners really, really well. And, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough that, you know, all my partners are actually super close to where, where we live right here. And getting to know that, knowing their family, knowing things like that, because no one wants to think about it. And, and you brought it up as, you know, having the ability to, to let them know. Cause, cause you're not, you're not able to be like, Hey, here's her phone number or whatever. You don't, you might not even know where your phone is at that point, or you're not, you might not even know your wife's phone number. Cause I know there's been times where I forgot my wife's phone number, but, uh, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, like I, I wanted, you know, my partner, I brought me in. I was like, man, you need to call my wife. And like, he didn't, he didn't know my wife's phone number. You know? I mean, they were asking my birthday. He didn't know my birthday either. And they come to find out. His wife and I share the same birthday and we never knew it. You know what I mean? Yeah, man, it's crazy, you know, but it just, it just goes to show like the importance, you know, like, like you were saying, Billy, um, getting to know your, uh, getting to know your, your guys, your guys and girls that work with you and trying to form that bond, not just at work, but outside of work. Yeah. And I, you know, I definitely mentioned the specialized small teams. That's, it, it's not special to that. It's, uh, you know, patrol teams, whatever, you know, know somebody that you're working with, you know, whether it's your sergeant, whatever it is, be like, Hey, here's my wife's number. If anything happens and you know, they're going to be like, that's, that's kind of morbid or, or whatever it may be. But Hey, my wife much rather hear it from somebody that on my department than social media, the news, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's wild. That, that actually, you guys bring up a really good point in that. And, um, you know, we've had, we've had incidences ourselves where, yeah, social media is such a big thing now where, it's almost like you got to be on top of it really, really quick because you know, it's going to get out there. And, and there's like, you know, crime watch Facebook groups and Instagram stuff with like neighborhood watch, you know, stuff where like, as, as soon as something happens, these people are posting stuff and it's, it's pretty wild how, how social media has really like, you know, driven how we operate at, as, as cops. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild. So, um, what was her reaction when she found out? I mean, I, 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 did you guys have kids or? Yeah, we have a son. Uh, he was seven at the time. She was actually, uh, she was actually in bed reading him a story when she got the call actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I said, we, uh, we live with my in-laws at the time cause we were, we were, uh, in the process in between houses moving. And, um, so my father-in-law actually drove her to the hospital and, um, you know, my mother-in-law stayed home um, with my son. And uh, so I was, I was actually uh, airlifted from that hospital to, um, to one a little about a uh, driving wise, it's about an hour and a half, but they, you know, they, they took me in a, in a helicopter up. Um, so I was at the initial hospital for about 45 minutes until they airlifted me. Um, she got there. She got there before they airlifted me. Though. She got, she got there probably, but then, 20 or 30 minutes of the incident probably was that fast. Yeah. Um, when she got there, I was, I was innovated already. They put me out pretty quick when I came in. Yeah. They put me out pretty quick when I came in there. Yeah. I do remember, um, the last thing I remember is telling, telling the nurses how to get my vest off when I came, but I also, I also remember I, uh, I got a pretty foul mouth as it is that uh, when you, when you add in injuries like that, it doesn't get any better. So I remember when I came in the ER, I was, you know, I was dropping quite a few F bombs and I remember apologizing to the nurse because there were so many other people in there that didn't need to hear that. And she was like, fucking kidding me. Like, don't worry about it. But uh, that's the last thing I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so being at like that, man, like I, I've never had any kind of surgeries or anything. So like, I'm not used to like anesthesia or anything like, like that in, until now. Um, but I remember being out and just like, I mean, it's because of the drugs that got you on, obviously, but I just remember thinking like I was living in a dream. Like I didn't even know what was going on. Like I would see flashes of people once in a while. And then, um, that was it. I remember. So that was on a Thursday night. I remember Friday, which I found out later would have been after my surgery. 
I remember seeing my wife uh, on my left side. I remember seeing my dad on my right side. And that, that was them leaving the hospital after my surgeries. Um, I'd ask my wife if that, if that, if that was actually real, if I, if I was, you know, dreaming it. But she said, yeah, that was us when we were leaving. Um, and then I don't really remember anything else until probably Saturday when they brought me out of the ICU down to like, uh, yeah, like at, the room. at what point, and I, I know they never know really until it's, it's all said and done, but at what point did they know that you were, you know, you were somewhat stable or you were going to make it kind of deal? Um, did they have it? Did they tell your wife that? Um, uh, I think they knew. I think they knew pretty quick. Yeah. I think they knew pretty quick. I was going to be all right. It was just a matter of what, uh, the extent the injuries were going to be, right. um, on the long run, you know? Um, but yeah, I think they knew pretty quick. I, I did find out later that, um, I talked to one of the, uh, nurses at the hospital later on. She said, I, if, if I didn't get to the hospital within like 20 minutes, I was going to have a problem yeah. with the bleeding out internally. So where, where did all the rounds end up hitting you? We know your leg, your hand, um, where else were you shot? Uh, yeah, so I had femur, hand, I took one in the left shoulder, uh, I took two in the right arm, and then I took one uh, actually to my plate carrier that uh, oh, ricocheted shit. and actually landed in my chin and uh, actually stuck. Yeah, so that's like one thing. When I was on the ground, I knew my leg was I knew I knew my leg was shot and my hands were broken. I could, I could, I could actually feel the bullet in my chin like with my tongue. I, could, like, I knew I had a bullet in my face. Like I remember telling my buddy on the way to the hospital, I was like, man, I think I got a bullet in my face. And he was like, yeah, buddy, you got a round in your face. Yeah. I was oh, like, man. all right, That's let's check it. <laughs> yeah, not too many yeah. people get, yeah, you know, get get shot like that and then live to talk about it, especially a cop. Shit, you stub your toe and yeah. you're, you're done. Yeah. Very um, fortunate. So how long was the recovery process after that until you got to go home? So I was in the hospital for a week. It was like six or seven days. Um got released from there, it transported me to a live-in rehab facility. I was there for another two weeks. So I got shot on December 10th. I came home on December 30th. So at home, how was the, uh, what was the recovery like for you? I mean, mentally, I mean, were you just, you know, kind of walk us through that a little bit? Um, well, I'll start with like, uh, before I get into home, I'll, I'll start with like, uh, yeah, yeah. Rehab. If that's all right with you. Um, so yeah, they brought me, they, they transported me to the rehab facility and, um, the, the great thing, well, there's, there's a bad thing. There's a bad part and there's a good part. The, the bad part was it was, this was during COVID. So outside of surgery, which I don't, I, I was, just, I was out anyway, so I, don't, I never got to see anybody, um, after surgery, I couldn't see my wife or my son or any, any family member because of COVID. They weren't allowed in the hospital. So um, I actually didn't see my wife or my son until the day I got released from the hospital. And I got to see them on the way during the transport on the way to the rehab facility. Um, and then once I got to the rehab facility, but while I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. While I was at the hospital, they were, they did allow a cop, a no, um, an officer from my agency and a, uh, task force officer with me 24 hours a day for the six or seven days I was there. So I wasn't alone, which was nice. Um, but no family members. And then once I got transported to the rehab facility, um, they wouldn't allow anybody in to see me. Not, I mean, officers or nothing. They, my wife was allowed up during the day, like during visiting hours and they kind of made an exception for her. Um, and I saw my son on Christmas for about an hour. Um, so I had to, yeah, so I had to, you know, I watched him open up Christmas, like on, you know, on, uh, FaceTime. <laughs> so that was my Christmas. Yeah. Um, but the, um, recovery was tough, man. Um, you know, I had a rod placed in my leg, um, pins and plates in my hands. Um, uh, I had, I had a few blood transfusions and so I had trouble like sitting up in bed for a while, um, without like passing out. Um, cause my blood pressure would just drop when I sat up. Um, but I remember, um, the first night at rehab when I got checked, I got there at night when I checked in, I remember it was like when everything kind of hit me because it was like my first, it was my first time alone. Cause I had had my brothers with me, um, you know, for the past week since the incident. Um, and my wife, my wife came up with me with the staff, the staff introduced herself to me and said, this is what, you know, to expect. And we're going to, we're going to talk to you more in the morning. And, um, 
my wife said goodbye and that was it now by myself. Um, kind of how, how the journey began right there. Um, I remember the first morning there, uh, it was on a Friday morning. Uh, I remember it was you know, pitch black in the room. I remember the door opening up to my room and the nurse coming in. And the only thing I could see was um, the door from the light in the hallway. And I was like, man, it's going to be, I just, I was like, this is going to be rough. Like, I don't even know what to expect. And so my wife came up uh, for that day. I met with the staff and they're like, what's your expectations? You know, what do you, what do you want to see from here? And I was like, oh, I want to walk out of here. And, um, you know, the expectation was it was going to take, you know, a year plus for me to get back to running again. I'm an avid runner. And um, it was just unacceptable. Like I couldn't accept the fact that all this happened. And now it's like, well, I'm, I can't run. I can't get across it. Like I can't do anything. It was just like soul crushing to me. Um, so I started thinking back on like people that I had followed, like on social media and stuff. And um, one of the names that stuck out to me, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Jason Redman or not. <clears throat> um, so I followed Jason for quite a while, you know, just, you know, as a follower and, um, Jason, uh, when he was injured, uh, I remember if for those of you listening, I don't know Jason Redmond, you need to go look him up. I'm not going to get into his story, but, uh, he was a Navy SEAL who was injured. Um, but anyway, I remember when he was in the hospital, I remember his story. He had a sign that he made, put on his door. And it was basically, a motivational thing, you know, um, don't come in here with shitty attitude kind of deal. And I thought that was super cool, man. And I started thinking, I was like, you know, that's first thing I saw this morning was that door. So I told my wife, I said, you coming up tomorrow. She's like, yeah, I'm coming up. I'm like, I need you to bring uh, some poster board and, you know, some of our son's markers. And like, she's like, all right. So she brought some up and my hands are all jacked up. So I was going to make, the, I was going to make the sign. So she was like, give me right it for you. I'm like, nah. I'll make it work. It's going to go, it's going to go up in my handwriting. Like I'm, I'm going to write it. So I made the sign up and put it on the door. And, um, it was basically, you know, this is how I received my injuries. You know, I received it from my brothers and I don't want you to go. I don't want anybody coming in my room that doesn't have a good attitude. And I don't want anybody coming in here. It's going to throw me a pity party. Like, I don't want to hear it. Cause that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to get better. So I put that sign up there, man. And every morning I woke up, that's the first thing I saw was that sign. And it was just, like a light bulb every morning, like, all right, you know, it's put up or shut up. Cause if I don't, you know, I'm just, I'm just being a hypocrite, you know? Um, and that's kind of where it started right there. It's just the whole mindset of yeah. you know, turning back. Yeah. It's really powerful. I mean, it really goes to show you that, uh, your mindset really is everything. And, you know, we've talked about before, you know, you can't, can't ever present, prevent yourself from being victimized, right? You were victimized, but we all have the uh, ability to not play a victim um, you don't have to let yourself be a victim, right? If you don't want to. And, um, I know exactly what you're talking about with the, the sign on the door, um, with Jason Redmond's story. And that, that's really cool. I mean, you know, um, mindset really is everything in that. And, uh, as much of a struggle as, is, as I'm sure as it was for you, um, you know, you got to tell yourself like, Hey, you know, don't feel sorry for yourself, you know, get through it. Um, and one of the things that, uh, I think is important for anybody that's involved in something like that, you know, I think people naturally have this feeling of wanting to, you know, tell you that they're sorry or tell you that they're sorry that that happened to you. And, you know, you hear that all the time. Um, to be honest, you know, like that was one of the things I hated hearing the most, um, being involved in some type of critical incident where people would call you and be like, Oh man, I'm really sorry that that happened to you. And I didn't, I didn't experience anything that you went through, but just people telling you that, you know, it gets kind of old and, um, you know, I had to tell people like, stop telling me that you're sorry. Like, what are you sorry for? Like, a, you know, I'm alive. Like I'm, I'm good. I'm a hundred percent good. Um, you know, so you're alive. Um, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, uh, put, put that mindset into, you know, guys like yourself that, <clears throat> that were in that position. Um, you know, you got to pump people up. You shouldn't, shouldn't, uh, make them feel like they're a victim. I think that's pretty powerful. Um, you know, albeit I get it. People feel bad or I think a lot of times people just don't even know how to interact with people that were in something like that. You know, they don't know what to say well, to you. Well, I, I think that nothing changes is the, is the way that I, I, if I was talking shit to you before you got hurt, 
I'm going to talk shit to you after you got hurt. You yeah. know, it's just, I mean, I'm, I might not say some things, but you know, there's, I'm still going to be that same person. And that, and I think that's, yeah, it, 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 nothing. Yeah. You're, you're still the same person. You're still, I mean, I'm pretty yeah. sure I've talked shit to you every day that I've ever talked to you, Kyle. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, like, you know, that's, that's just the way that I've always talked to Kyle. Yeah, you know, and I've done some other podcasts in the past where, like, people have asked me, what advice would you give, you know, your friends or coworkers or whatever if you're involved in something like that? And, you know, one, one of my things I always adv advise, uh, my advice I always gave was, you know, you could always reach out to those people and just tell them, like, hey, I'm glad you're okay or whatever, and, you know, I'm, I'm proud of you or whatever you want to say. But I really do think the worst thing to say is, hey, I'm, I'm sorry that that happened to you. And, yeah. you know, don't, don't play into that victimization. Um, because I can really mentally. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sorry it happened to me. You know what I mean? I mean, I did my job and I did my job the way that I was trained to do it. And there's nothing that would change about it. It's just, it's the nature of the beast. It's, you know, it's, it's an unfortunate thing that. Uh -huh. Yeah, no doubt. Our profession, you know, and um, once you accept that, you'll be a lot better off. I mean, it's, it's, it's it sucks, but it's, that's life, you know? And it, when, it, when, as far as it comes to recovery, I mean, life's not going to wait for us. You, you got to do what you got to do to get better because, you know, it's it, as cliche as it sounds, it, it's the truth. You know, you, you get busy living or you get busy dying, man. And, I, and it, that's a fact of life. And I'm not going to sit back and waste my life pitying myself because something ha happened to me. You know, I have a family to support and I got to get back to that. I, and then sitting around and being a bad example for my kids is. Well, and and uh, we talked about it in a, in a previous uh, recording that we did about how, you know, like we, I, I don't know your whole story and obviously you've had something very traumatic happen to you, but you know, it happens to partners and stuff too, uh, whether it be death or, or whatever. And, and I've experienced that personally. And, you know, a lot of people are like, Hey, you, you know, you need your time off. You need this, you need that. And, and I, and I respect that some people do or whatever for me, you know, we all, we're all different people. And, you know, obviously if I was dealing with an injury and, and stuff like that, it's completely different. But, uh, you know, like I've had a, a, a good friend that was killed in the line of duty. And, and for me, it was like, okay, what, what do I need to do? Like, let's move on. Let's get, you know, I got my job to do. Like you've said, you know, let's, let's get on. Let's go after it. Yeah. I, I, I can't agree more. I mean, um, you know, and, and it may sound harsh, but the reality is, is like, we all do sign up for this job and, and, um, you know, there, are, we, we should know the risks that come with it. Our jobs as being cops is to mitigate those risks as much as possible. The unfortunate part is, is you're never going to hundred percent mitigate, um, you know, being involved in something like that. Like it's just impossible. Uh, but what you can do is, you know, you can use good tactics. You can slow things down. You can, you know, come up with game plans, um, do all the things that you should be doing whether you've done it a hundred times or not do it anyways um, and do it to the best of your potential and make sure that everybody's on board with everything that, you know, what make sure everyone's on board with the same plan. Um, and like I said earlier, like nine out of 10 times shit goes our way. Uh, yeah. But, but the one time it doesn't, you don't want to be caught off guard and freaking swept under your feet. And you know, you're bleeding out. Your partner doesn't know where the hell he's even at. He doesn't live in, in the area. Um, you know, he loses his GPS. Like, that's, you know, you got to be able to navigate through that stuff. And if you're not prepared for it, that could be life and death for you or your partner, you know, so. And, and one of the hardest things that I've, I've gone through, uh, personally is like the, the aftermath and people will sit there. And I mean, when, when things are happening, they're dynamic and they're changing. And I'm, I, from what you told me, it sounds like you guys did an awesome job, both you, your team and everything. Um, you know, when we sit back and we can, I'm sure you've gone through this, uh, maybe more times, times than anybody wants to, but you know, you can sit there and you'd be like, Oh, you could have done this. You could have done that. You could have, your partner could have done this. You could have done that. And it's, it's like, that doesn't help anything in the long run. Yeah. There's always, there's always, you know how it is in this job. I mean, there's always Monday morning quarterbacks that I would have done it this way. I would have done it that way, but you, yeah, know, you didn't do it, it that way. You know yeah. why? Cause you weren't and it doesn't help you. It it doesn't help the situation. I'm sure you realize some things that, that could have been done different, but <laughs> there, there's no way that you can do the perfect thing every time. 
And it's planning and having a good plan and going with it. And your partner's knowing what they're doing. Yep. You make your choices. Yeah. You make your choices yeah. and you and then, them, you know, you can't, you can't. And the other thing is, is, you know, is I is. brought up the small team atmosphere and working in small teams. And it's, it's really important to train with your small teams or your teams, not even small teams, whatever it may be. And cause you know, you knew what your partners were doing. They knew what you were doing. They're not thinking like, what the heck is this? You know, like all of a sudden you're right behind the car. They're like, no, that's what we do. And having those plans and, and knowing where to go from there, knowing what everybody's doing, not just knowing what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, everyone's got to be on the same page. So what was the, uh, the recovery like for you? Um, you know, while you were in the, the rehab place, how long were you there for before you got to even go home? Uh, so I was in the, the rehab facility for two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. Um, it was rough, man. Um, for what it was, I made the best of it. And, you know, I tried to have some fun in there, you know, cause you got, you got to do the best, make the best of the situation, you know? Um, but it was, it was brutal, man. It was, it was, it was, it was a painful experience. Um, if anyone has a, that, that's had a rod put in their leg, I'm sure can, can relate. It's, when they put that rod in there, man, it's, it's, there's a lot of scar tissue. I mean, it just like your, your leg, ba- I, I had no muscle basically cause I had to, they have to go through your muscle to put the rod cause the rod's actually in my bone. It's not like fastened to the outside. It's like in, in your bone. Um, so it's building that muscle back up and then breaking all that scar tissue. And that's like the most painful thing next to get, next to getting shot was going on there and getting that scar tissue broken up. It was brutal. Um, I remember being in there, daily and just trying to take as much pain as I could to the point where, you know, I was screaming and crying to the point where the physical therapist had to like take breaks because they were starting to just to, to cry, watching me cry. But, um, but you just gotta do what you gotta do. You know, you get, you just gotta, you gotta get through it and you gotta get it over with. And it's, that's the only way you can be able to move on. So that's just kind of the mindset I kept is just take it, take it, take it until we can get this out of here. You know? Um, I had a goal, you know, in the hospital, when I was in the hospital, days after the shooting, they, when they told me, first told me it was going to be a year plus until I could run again. I was like, well, I said, I'm going to run a half marathon this year. <laughs> so, you know, nobody really wanted to say, no, you're not, you know, but like you could see the look on their faces. Um, but I mean, I'm, I, I ran 11 miles this morning. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it's all mindset, man. It's just get out there and getting after it, you know, it's get out there and getting after it. Yeah. I, I hate running. I don't think I've ever ran 11 miles. <laughs> Let alone with a, with a rod in my leg. Like, yeah. Hey, way to make us look bad. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. Yeah. Like, I don't have an excuse. Like, ah, you know, like, yeah, yeah. just a little, you know, there's a little tweak yeah. in my back or something. Yeah. Here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's like one of my, one of, like one of my saving graces was I was in, I was in decent shape going into this too, which is, which is one of the things that that's really helped me in my recovery yeah. was I was going, I was in good shape going into it. Um, but yeah, it's yeah. just, well, I mean, yeah, my staying after it, man, I'm gonna get on my soapbox a little bit and not that I'm a specimen of, of health or whatever, even close to it, but, um, you look like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I did like, I did like 50 push ups yeah, I mean, before we good, started man. this just to get that spell on, you know, <laughs> but, um, no, like, I mean, right, right. <laughs> Having that physical and mental yeah. health, which I, for me, I think the physical health helps with my mental health, but, um, having that physical health is, is just paramount in this job. Um, you know, you get in a fight, it happens more often than a lot of people would like to believe, you know, you get in a car accident, you get in anything, just having that ability to, to, you know, deal with it and having those regiments and everything that, that help you to, to recover. I think, and, and they, they give you something goals to work towards because, you know, you said I'm running a half marathon and, you know, for me, I would never say I ha- I'm going to run a half marathon because I haven't said that ever, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, whatever it may be, you know, I, I'm going to, you know, some people are power lifters, you know, just yeah. have those, have those things and be healthy. Yeah. Being, being physically fit. I mean, and active, like, that that plays a crucial part, and if you're ever injured or, or whatever, right? I mean, you're you're only doing yourself a favor by doing that. So, um, so you're uh, so you're there for two weeks. You get to go home. Um, you know what was that like for you getting getting to be able to actually go home? Man, it was uh, 
I mean, next to my son being yeah. born, man, it was like the happiest day of my life, you know? Um, yeah. So I got released and, uh, came home, actually came home a day early. Um, they let me go a day early because I was, I was doing well. So they let me go a day early. So I actually came home and surprised my son. That was great. Um, and then, uh, once I got, I got home on, uh, December 30th and then New Year's Eve, I started back in uh, outpatient, uh, physical therapy the next day. Yeah. New Year's no Eve kidding. night, I went, I went to, uh, therapy. So how's it been, um, leading up to this far? I mean, how, how have your injuries recovered and like, where are you at mentally and physically? Um, physically, um, I'd say I wouldn't say my legs hundred percent yet. I still have some nerve damage in it. You know, I have some like dead spots where I can't feel shit. Um, flexibility is pretty good, but it's not, it's not hundred percent yet. I can run, but, um, you know, you, your leg moves in different directions. So there's not quite there all, all the way yet, but it will be, um, hands. I've had numerous surgeries since then. So, um, I just had one on my left, on my left thumb, or I'm sorry, my right thumb, uh, like two weeks ago, uh, to clean up some scar tissue from one of the other surgeries. Um, I got another one probably around November, December for my left thumb. I have a plate that's in there that I got to take out, um, just so I can get some mobility back in my thumb again and that in my left thumb. Um, mentally, man, like I, honestly, like I, I feel really good. Um, you know, I'm happy, man. Like I, as crazy as it is, like I'm probably like one of the, some of the happiest times I've had in my life have been this year, just cause I yeah. think I appreciate life a lot more. Um, I, I, I really don't have anything bad to say. I mean, obviously, you know, there's days I don't, I don't have bad days. I have like bad moments through the day where like, you know, like, you know, it'll get me down, but it's only like a couple minutes and then I'm just kind of like, yeah. dude, get over it, man. You know, I'm not going to do my thing, go for a run or whatever I got to do. But oh, honestly, man, I, I, I feel really good. I mean, I really do. I, I'm really happy with everything right now. I really am. And I and I think that's a, a testament to your, you know, I, it sounds like you're physically tough, but uh, mental toughness is, is really important. And from your stories of rehab to what you're telling me today, sounds like, you know, you're 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 a tough motherfucker. In more ways than one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, like, I don't know. People, like, it's crazy, man. Because, like, people, I meet people all the time. And they're like, you know, they tell you, like, what a badass you are and a warrior you are and all that stuff. And don't get me wrong. Like, it's cool to hear that sometimes. But at the same time, it's like, man, I don't, like, I don't feel like that. I just feel like I went out and did something that any of us in this job would do. And I'm just handling it the way that mm-hmm. is yeah. best for me to handle it, to handle it, you know? Um, I don't feel like I'm a superpower or anything. I just, you know, I feel like, I feel like we could all do it. I think we could all, I think everyone could have the same recovery that I've had it or even better. Yeah. I just think it's all, it's all upstairs. You know, it's just a matter of finding, you know, like I talked to a lot of people about like motivation and what motivates people and, and stuff, but you know, and I have things that motivate me too. And motivation is great, but really what gets me through this isn't motivation it's drive. You know, I found this drive in me. Um, to get me where I want to be. And that what drives me is my family. You know, that's, that's my saving grace in this whole thing is my family. You know, that, that's what gave me the mindset to hey. get to where I am now. You know, um, motivation is a great thing, but when you're driven by something like it's, it's well, gonna be a and I think that it's, and, and I haven't, hopefully I'm never in a situation like yours, you know, let's be honest, but, um, and I never have been, but I think it's easier to get on the the pity side. You know, so many people are sitting there telling you like, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And it's easy to, to have pity for yourself and like, Oh, it sucks. This sucks, whatever. And, and granted it sucks. Like, uh, I'm sure you know better than anybody, but just fighting through it and having that motivation is, is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Fighting through it, man. And you know, that's like, Look, man, I'm sitting here. I'm talking to you guys. Everything's attached. Some of it's attached by metal, but whatever. You know, like I'm here. There's a lot of people out there that are a lot worse off than I am. You know, there's a lot of people that have been through a lot more. And unfortunately, there's people that didn't make it, you know. Um, and having that support, having that support group that you're talking about, like your family, your family's huge. And, you know, a family that supports you you know, you know, during the thing. And I'm sure we haven't talked much about it, but I'm sure your teammates support you. Yeah. And that, and that goes back to 
you know, like being in tune with your team. I mean, I mean, we've all been on vacation together this year. You know, I mean, it's it's just it's it's been it goes back to the, like my mindset this year. It's, I've had a good time, man. You know, I've gotten a lot yeah. of good things came out of this for what it is. You know, like we, you know, we go on vacations together now. We hang out on the weekends. Our kids play together, and like and, and the whole things like yeah. why didn't we do that before? You know, yeah. like why didn't we ever do that kind of shit before? It, it took this for that to happen. I mean, I'm glad we're doing it now, but it sucks that it took this for us yeah. to do that. You know, we yeah. talk about that all the time. You know, um, but I think that's an important lesson for a lot of other officers out there. I, I, you know, get get your get your guys and girls together yeah. and get to know everybody. Uh huh. I agree. You know, us as human beings sometimes are sick people when it comes to um. You know, it, it takes a a tragedy to happen for people to to unite. You know. Um, we just celebrated right nine eleven, right? The twentieth anniversary for that. And it's like, you know, um back when something like that happens, the whole country comes together, you know. Doesn't matter what 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 party you're you're for, everybody's everybody's there for each other and and you know, and same goes in law enforcement. When something really bad happens, we're all we all rally together and we're all there for each other and, and the support system is there. Um, but you're right, like when that's not going on, you know our job sometimes is, is cutthroat and some guys and gals in our job, you know, you got, you got backstabbers, you got, you got people that are like looking out for themselves all the time. And, um, sometimes there's a lot of hatred, hatred in our culture, in, in our community and law enforcement, you know, until someone gets shot or killed or, or whatever. And then we all come together and it's just like, what a sad thing that something like that has to happen for all of us to come together and unfortunately around here, man, it, it seems like, um, at least at his department, you know, he's had a lot of guys shot and killed recently. Um, or just over the course of a couple of years, there's been several, one being a good friend of his, um, you know, I just feel like it's happening way too often and, you know, people really need to listen to like what you're saying. You know, I think you offer a really powerful message, um, you know, that it's, it's a, uh, it's a really good friendly reminder that, um, you know, even when things are going right, we all still need to be, we all need to be there for each other and, and uh, you know, un- unite with, with each other. So um, if you could offer uh, some folks, any advice, man, like what, what would it be if you could sum it up? You know, regardless of what it is you're going through, whether it's, you know, you're a cop and you get injured in a line of duty or, you know, you're working from home and fall off a ladder. I don't even care if you're a cop or not, whatever it is. If you get hurt, you're down, you got family issues. I don't care what it is. You can't give up on yourself. You can't give up on life. You have to keep moving forward somewhere. There's someone that depends on you, whether you think so or not. There's someone out there that depends on you. You know, there's someone out there that's looking up to you. And you you don't just owe it to yourself. You owe it to them to get out and do the best that you can to get back to where you were. You just can't give up on life, man. It's life's too short, and giving up on it's not, it's not helping anybody. It's definitely not helping yourself. You know, it's 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 too short to do that, man. You know, it's just it's all about keeping the right mindset and putting the work in. And I promise you, if you put that work in, it will pay off. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. And um, you know, and it's also a, a friendly reminder, you know, for for people out there. You know, you like you've listened to to podcasts, and you said you follow Jason Redman and his story, and that kind of motivated you, right? Like someone's going to hear your story and just think, like your your story is going to motivate somebody, um, and that's why we like to do these, is because you know we may be in our own little bubble bubble here in our own little world, but outside of our world, there's so many other people that that watch these or they pay attention to these, and um you know, you're affecting other lives as well. And so I think that's also important, um, you know, spreading your message. So, you know, I I would encourage you and it sounds like you do anyways, but to get out there and, you know, spread that message and, and somebody somewhere out there, you may never even know it. You may never hear from them. Um, but they're going to hear your message and, and it, it may save their life one day, just like, just like Jason did, you know, with yours. So, um, and that's one of the things, man, you know, like as cops, we're so, we, we're so protective. Like we protect ourselves so much. Yeah. Like when shit happens, like we don't talk about it. You know, we don't, we don't talk to the public, you know? And like, I get that to a point, but with my situation, like 
I had that mindset, and I didn't. I never had any intention in the get go, like from the, from out the gate to like I'm going to do this so I can yeah. help other people. I was just trying to get better, you know. And then I just started being more vocal about my progress, and next thing you know, I'm getting you know, yeah, uh, social media messages and phone calls, and text messages, and emails about how I help people do that, and that, which is why I became more boisterous on yeah on on my story, you know, because I knowing that I I'm helped, I have helped other people in whatever way it is it goes full circle because it really yeah. comes back to me and drives me even more, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No doubt, man. I mean, it's, it's a powerful message. And like I said, you may be reaching people that you don't even know. Um, you know, so it's a real selfless, it's a selfless thing to do. Well, it, it's a powerful message and it, and you've been through the, the extreme of it, I think. And some people, especially cops, like you said, work guard or whatever, will be like, Oh yeah. You know, like, you know, what he went through is, is very, you people can obviously understand what you went through, but some people are like, Oh, I, you know, I tweaked my back in a, in a fight. I, I broke my hand. I did something like that. Um, or just straight mental. Um, and your message can help them out a hundred percent. And I, I think that that's, I, that's part of my motivation for doing this whole show. And, um, you know, cause it's not for the, it's not for the, the money and the, and the free beers, I guess. Actually, I do get like I, get, I do get like a six pack free every time I come over. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got. I mean, it. you I got, got a good great. gig over there. Man. Yeah. I got. You know, yeah, no, nah, it is. It's it's a, it is all about the message, you know. Um, so so where are you at uh, before we wrap it up? Where are you at right now? I mean, you're obviously you're still recovering. You still have another surgery coming up. Um, do you think you're on the tail end of your recovery, or do you still have a little ways to go? What do you What do you think? I think I'm getting towards the tail end. Like I said, I got, I got one more surgery and then, you know, my goal is to be having some answers about January, about what, when I'm coming back. Um, I'm hoping to get this other surgery done and push through physical therapy and, and uh, yeah. really have my hands back where they need to be. Um, but, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm just taking it day by day and trying not to worry about it too much. Yeah. It's, all, it's all you can do. And optimism's huge. I yeah. think optimism is huge for any, any situation, you know, always being like, yeah, it's, it's, I'm going to be this. I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm going to run a full marathon. Maybe not me. I mean, maybe, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is, that is really cool, man. And, um, gosh, I know, I know that you are, you are going to inspire a lot of people out there and, you know, always keep that in the forefront of your, your mind that you're inspiring somebody. You already inspired me. I mean, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I think you've, you've inspired for sure. Both of us, us. you know, I, uh, you know, I can sit there and I can, I can talk shit about so many little things that have happened to me and injuries or whatever. And, you know, sit there and you're like, Oh, this guy's, I'm not going to sit here and talk shit about it to this guy. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the way, I mean, that's, that's the way I feel now. Like when I look at people that are worse off than I am, I'm like, what am I bitching about? You know I mean? That's, I'm the same thing that you're saying now. You know, yeah, just to and, a different degree. And I but. think, a, you know, another important message out of all this too is, um, you know, for the, for the cops out there is, and we, we've already talked about it. It's just utilize good tactics. You know, don't, don't just roll into something just cause you've done it a hundred times that you, you know, it's going to go your way. Always have a contingency plan, you know, have plan a, have plan B and fuck have plan C. Um, you know, so, and, and talk to people out there. Like, you know, I brought it up about, you know, the task force and everything about how that being great, especially for small departments and everything. If, uh, you know, someone's been out there and they've done it and they've done some different things, tactics wise, whatever, because you know, I'm not the tactical guy. I, I, I never will be. I have a lot of great people that are tactical guys and I've done some tactical shit. I'll tell you that. But, uh, you know, being like, hey, how do, how do we do this entry? How do we do these room clearing? You know, these guys have gone to SWAT school like you guys have. And, you know, me, I'm like, yeah, I run in there and grab the bad guy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's that easy. And and that's where things go really bad because – and knowing that your partners are like, okay, you know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing because we've all done it together too yeah. many times to count. Yeah. Try not to – try not to let yourselves get complacent, you know. Um, put – always put yourself in check and put your partners in check too. You know, if you see your partners doing stuff where you're like, eh, probably shouldn't have done it that way. Don't, don't just shy away and walk away from that. You know, say, say something to them, pull them, pull them to the side. You don't have to bust them out in front of people, but, and you don't have to be a dickhead about it either. Just pull them aside and put them in check. You know, um, 
you, well, you might, might save their life. Well, that, that brought up that, you know, like I, I worked on small teams and everything and, um, you know, n- no, no, no words don't count. Like I've been there for maybe six months and I might have an idea that is better than the guy that's been there for five years. And, and that's the great thing about my team and most teams is they'll listen to it and be like, okay, that's, that's stupid because of this. And you're like, oh, okay, that is stupid because of this, but you know, at least it's out there and you're talking about it and saying, okay, that's an idea. That's an idea. This is, this is the best way of doing it. And, and safety and especially in the fugitive side is, is very important because they're not good people that you're after. Yeah, no, no. So, Hey, TJ, tell, uh, tell everybody where they can get a hold of you. Um, you know, if they want to reach out to you, your social media and all that. Yes. I'm on Facebook, uh, TJ Webb. Um, I prefer Instagram. It's easier for me. Uh, but you can find me on Instagram at K nine Hank letter K number nine H E N K at K nine Hank. Um, if you want to follow my story, um, check me out. If you got any questions, check me out. Shoot me a message. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, but yeah, right on. well, man, like I said, you know, you have a really powerful message and I have no doubt that, uh, you are helping people out there and, you know, I thank you. Um, you know, I'm sure Billy, Billy's, Feeling the same? No, I don't thank you. Yeah. <laughs> of course I'm kidding. Derek, um, you know, we, we, we can't thank you enough for taking time out of your night to share your story, which is an incredible story. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I hope you heal up soon. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. And, you know, thank, thanks. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'd love to come back on again later down the road, maybe, and uh, share the progress, see where we're at. You got to you gotta program. welcome whenever yeah. you want. If you want to just pop in for a quick 10 minutes we don't care yeah yeah, yeah. we'll we'll uh yeah you're cool welcome man. anytime yeah, and um you know we'll we'll spread your message out there and um you know again man we we appreciate you coming on so um take care of yourself uh take care of your family yeah, awesome. and uh good luck with your house that uh that you're building yeah appreciate yeah, it guys. absolutely man appreciate, really it. appreciate it thank it. you all right guys um we're gonna wrap this up um make sure that uh if you guys like uh like what you're hearing, you know, subscribe to our channel, give us a review and, um, you know, all of that stuff helps us out, helps us do interviews like these. And it brings, you know, people like TJ out to spread the message out there so that we can all get better. Um, so thank you. And, uh, we will see you all again. Hey, we're out of shot fired. Copy, additional shot fired. Shot fired, shot fired. Shooting at us. Shooting at officer.